Welcome to Cherry Grove Friends Church. Today is Sunday, September 22nd, 2024. Well, welcome to Cherry Grove. It's great to be able to worship with each of you today. Uh, appreciate seeing all of you. Um, as well as the people that are watching this as a recording. We appreciate those who uh, do the recording each week and uh, put the work into that. And uh, it's great that we're all able to worship to get God together, um, even if it's not the same time. Today's reading is Romans 8, 14 through 17. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings in order that we may also share in his glory. <clears throat> it always makes me wonder when people say that God is on my side. We can't just go wherever we want and expect God to follow us. What kind of God would that be? <clears throat> Does Romans say the Spirit is to be led by us? No, it says we are to be led by the Spirit. The appropriate question we should ask ourselves is not whether God is on my side, but whether I am on God's side. But if we follow God, that doesn't mean we would be a slave to God. If we are led by the Spirit, then we are the children of God, not slaves. We have a benevolent God who considers us to be his children. So as his heirs, we can trust that he's going to provide us with what we need. Note that freedom from suffering on this earth is not a need. Romans says if we are God's children, then we will share in Christ's suffering. But if we are led by the Spirit of God, we don't need to be afraid of this suffering or even death because this will result in also sharing in Christ's glory. If a person is a slave to sin, then it's appropriate that they should be afraid. But if you are following the Spirit, that's when you no longer need to fear. Notice Romans doesn't say that we won't fear. We can still allow ourselves to fear, if, even if that's a bad choice. There are a lot of people in our culture using media trying to influence us with fear, especially during this election season. And it's amazing how effective they are at bringing out our fears. But since Romans says when we are led by the Spirit, we don't need to live in fear, then apparently it's possible to do so, to not live in fear. <clears throat> As we mature in following the Spirit of God, we can learn how to be less afraid. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, please help us to discern and follow your Spirit, and then help us to trust you to provide what we really need and to not be afraid. In Christ's name, amen. Praise to the Lord, the Almighty, the King of creation. All my soul praise Him, for He is Thy help and salvation. All ye who hear, now to His temple draw. Praise Him in glad adoration. Praise to the Lord who o'er all things so wondrously reigneth. Shelters be under His wings, ye so gently sustain.
to continue this morning, reading from Romans 8, verses 18 through 21. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the freedom and glory of the children of God. I think a passage like this is really apt on the first day of fall. Uh, while things are all really quite lovely right now, uh, fall is a precursor to winter when everything begins to wither and fade. And yet, Winter is a precursor to spring, when everything returns to life and flower. So let us not forget that our subjugation to frustration in perhaps the fall or winter of our own lives is a precursor to a new flowering in the resurrection. Pray with me. Grant us, Lord, that we would not be anxious about the world as it is, but give us love for the world as it will be in the day of the resurrection. And even now, while we are placed in a world where so many things at least seem to be passing away, help us to hold fast to those things that shall endure to those things that are being transformed, to those things that will become resurrected life forever. May we work, Lord, not merely for the preservation of what was, but for the coming renewal of all things which will be. In the power of the Holy Spirit and through Jesus Christ our Lord, we know you will accomplish these things. And in that same Lord's name we pray. Amen. I'm reading from Romans chapter 8, 22 through 27. I love this because the whole creation groans, not just we that groan in whatever suffering we may have, but all creation groans. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope, we were saved. 
But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through the wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. That's a relief. The Spirit interceding for us? Wow! So this is our prayer and praise time. Well, I hope you found all that as encouraging as I did. Uh, there are few things as encouraging as just hearing people say, prayers were answered, uh, God provided, and in big and small things, God providing 18 quarts of tomatoes uh, actually doesn't sound that small to me, but I didn't have to carry them, so I don't know. Uh, God revealing ways in which you can use your natural talents in the service of the community, one another, and his kingdom. It's a beautiful thing to hear. Uh, so I, I am just delighted that this is a thing we get to do every single week. Uh, you know, I, I think sometimes that so, a few of you have been going to this church for some time, I, I understand, um, and, and maybe, maybe, have, uh, maybe have grown a little bit accustomed to the fact that you get to hear this week after week after week from one another. Um, but I just want to remind you that this is not normal. People, we're weird. And we're weird in a really good way. So it is a beautiful thing. Keep sharing these things. Keep building one another up. Keep using your gifts. Keep paying attention to how God has provided. It is a wonderful thing. Uh, so we are going to read together Psalm 20, and then we are going to worship God in song. Uh, that is a wonderful opportunity. It looks like Mita is ready to take out some kids for children's church. And yes, it looks like Sherry's... All right, there we go. So while they are going, we are going to read together Psalm 20. It's up there. Great. Read this with me. May the Lord answer you when you are in distress. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and grant you support from Zion. May he remember all your sacrifices and accept your burnt offerings. May he give you the desire of your heart and make all your plans succeed. May we shout for joy over your victory and lift up our banners in the name of our God. May the Lord grant all your requests. Now this I know. The Lord gives victory to his anointed. He answers him from his heavenly sanctuary. With the victorious power of his right hand, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They are brought to their knees and fall, but we rise up and stand firm. Lord, give victory to the king. Answer us when we call. Lamb that was slain, who has borne all our 
next song is a triumphant Bible song which paraphrases the beginning of the Song of Moses and Miriam in Exodus 15, which just happened to be read by Rob Woodard last Sunday. The song celebrates the Lord's victory over the Egyptians after the Israelites crossed the Red Sea. There's a second verse to this, which is a step forward in time to recount the joy that we have in Jesus. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously, the horse and rider thrown into the sea. The Lord, my God, my strength and song, has now become my victory. The Lord, my God, my strength and song, has now become my victory. to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The grave is empty, won't you come and see? I will sing unto the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The grave is empty, won't you come and see? The Lord, my God, my strength and song has now become my victory. strength and song has now become my victory. The Lord is God and I will praise him our covenant God and I will exalt him. The Lord is God and I will praise him our covenant God and I will exalt him. God, we thank you that your time is always perfect. That the changing seasons of the year, the changing seasons of life, changing events of the world are not lost on you, and that all things are made beautiful, as ugly as they may seem at first, in your time. 
Lord, we humbly ask that you would do a work in us so that we may see things as you see them. That we may walk by faith, believing that your time is indeed perfect. That we may be obedient to your will and your commands, even when it doesn't seem to make any sense in the world in which we live. May we have the humility to put ourselves underneath your direction. As we turn to your word this morning, I pray that you would open it up to us to teach us the things that we uh, have, have lacked. I pray that you would open our hearts to receive uh, the words that you have left here for us for this time and place. Lord God, thank you for making this world and making it beautiful and not leaving it in the ugliness that happens when we choose to make it as we would rather than as you would, but restoring it to the endless beauty for which it was designed. In the name of your Son, the power of your Spirit, we pray these things. Amen. Family history can be fascinating, and family history can be disturbing, and family history can be shocking, and family history can be delightful. Not many of us know our great-grandparents, though maybe a few. Even fewer would know your great-great-grandparents, and virtually none of us in this era of latter family life, in which people wait till older to have children, will we never know any generations before that. It was rare in history, it's even more rare now. But I want to take you once again to a time long ago when the book of Genesis was likely being recited from one generation to the next, perhaps a, a family like that of Abraham wandering Arameans on the Aramean plain, and hearing recited your family history, going back not two, three, four, or five generations, but dozens. Gathered around a fire, you hear the story of your ancestors the things that have come before you. We're in Genesis chapter 5. I'm going to read the entire chapter. This is the written account of Adam's family line. When God created mankind, He made them in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them, and He named them mankind when they were created. When Adam had lived 130 years, he had a son in his own likeness, in his own image, and he named him Seth. After Seth was born, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Adam lived a total of 930 years, and then he died. When Seth had lived 105 years, he became the father of Enosh, and after becoming the father of Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Seth lived a total of 912 years, and then he died. When Enosh had lived 90 years, he became the father of Canaan. After he became the father of Canaan, Enosh lived 815 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enosh lived 905 years, and then he died. When Kenan had lived 70 years, he became the father of Mahalahel. After he became the father of Mahalahel, Kenan lived 860 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Kenan lived 910 years, and then he died. When Mahalahel had lived 65 years, he became the father of Jared. After he became the father of Jared, Mahalahel lived 830 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Mahalahel lived 895 years, and then he died. When Jared had lived 162 years, he became the father of Enoch. After he became the father of Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Jared lived 962 years, and then he died. When Enoch 
had lived 65 years, he became the father of Methuselah. After he became the father of Methuselah, Enoch walked faithfully with God 300 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Enoch lived a total of 365 years. Enoch walked faithfully with God, and then he was no more because God took him away. When Methuselah had lived 187 years, he became the father of Lamech. After he became the father of Lamech, Methuselah lived 872 years and had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Methuselah lived a total of 969 years, and then he died. When Lamech had lived 182 years, he had a son. He named him Noah. He said, he will comfort us in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground the Lord has cursed. After Noah was born, Lamech lived 595 years, had other sons and daughters. Altogether, Lamech lived a total of 777 years, and then he died. After Noah was 500 years old, he became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Did you notice something? And then he died. It is the refrain of every family history in the human existence. Our ancestors lived. They clearly had children because you are here. And then they died. Except when they didn't. If I were to break down the, this passage's major points, I think there's two. Death stalks everyone. And death is not inevitable. Death stalks everyone, but death is not inevitable. A couple observations about the passage in general. One is the large number of years, which I'm sure you noticed, people living an extremely long time. There are a great number of opinions about what these years mean, whether they're talking about whole family lines lasting a certain length of time, whether these are symbolic numbers, whether people literally lived that long in the past, and there is no agreement. None. I find no reason to doubt that these numbers actually mean that human beings lived incredibly long lives in the early generations of the creation. But how much weariness is added to the human soul when you think of living 900 years? Even if your body does not decay, at what point in your working life do you not get up in the morning, look yourself in the mirror and say, I'm kind of done. I remember doing that in my 20s. Can you imagine doing it in your 880s? I think one of the great themes of people living so long in this early time was that their lives were toil. Their lives were farming. They were attempting to raise their own livelihood from the cursed soil of the world. They worked the sweat of their brow. They had children. They had pain in childbirth. The human experience was one of toil, and yet it lasted for so long. We see the beginning of the turning of this in the birth of Noah, which is, is the Hebrew word that means rest or comfort, noha. That Lamech's hope is one who will give us comfort, give us rest in the labor and painful toil of our hands caused by the ground that the Lord had cursed. These incredibly long lives, I don't think, are being, being held up as some sort of ideal. Like, can you imagine the toil of a life of 900 years? Next week, I want to talk a little bit more about Noah and the wickedness of the world that happens in chapter 6. But this week, I want to look at this glaring exception that appears in the person of Enoch. 
verses 21 through 24. He breaks the refrain of, and then he died. We are simply told, Enoch walked faithfully with God and then was no more because God took him away. Why did Enoch not die? Because he walked with God. Now we could go backwards and look at the first few chapters of Genesis and see how in the garden, Adam and Eve walked with God in the cool of the day. And then that relationship is broken when they leave, but somehow Enoch, generations down the line, walks with God. Walking with God is the key to evading death. Walking with God is the key to evading death. Enoch is the only character here described as walking faithfully with God, and when he does, God apparently just invites him home one day. I once heard a sermon where, uh, that was on this passage, or on, the, on the character of Enoch, saying, you know, it's like they just went on a walk every afternoon. At the end of one of those walks, God said, why don't you just come back to my place? Walking with God is the key to not dying. But what is walking with God? What does that mean? Now, this passage does not give us a whole lot of hints but fortunately, this is the fifth chapter of the Bible, and there are great many more afterwards. So what I'm going to do this morning is walk through, walk through the meaning of walking with God according to Scripture. And my conclusion, what I'm aiming at, the thesis of this message, is that walking with God is walking by faith, for obedience with humility. To walk with God is walking by faith for obedience with humility. Now, the first one's easy because it turns out this is not the last verses in the Bible that mention Enoch. Faith makes walking with God possible. It is not possible to walk with God without faith. Well, how do we know that? Well, we can go all the way forward to Hebrews chapter 11. The next time Enoch is mentioned at any length in the Bible, in Hebrews chapter 11, the author of that epistle tells us that by faith, Enoch was taken from this life so that he did not experience death. He could not be found because God had taken him away. Before he was taken, he was commended as one who pleased God, and without faith, it is impossible to please God because anyone who comes to him must Believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. The author of Hebrews has given us a very concise definition of walking by faith. Believe that God exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. Enoch, absent all of this information that we have in Scripture thousands of years of salvation history, which we are privileged to draw upon, Enoch somehow arrived at a point of believing that God was and believing that what God is, is good. And so he walked with God by faith. Enoch believed, and he believed that God was good. Now, I think we can get tripped up when it comes to faith sometimes. Uh, we can start to believe that faith is a, a, a feeling, a sentiment, purely an emotion, uh, that, it's, that it's a kind of confidence, purely confidence. You know, it, this tells us that Enoch believed, and it gives us very few details beyond that. It doesn't say that he had great confidence or that he was bold. Uh, both the confident and the doubting actually may live by faith. Uh, we have examples of this in Scripture. Consider the, the Roman centurion who asked Jesus to heal his servant. And he speaks with great confidence as a man who understands authority. He looks at Jesus and said, look, I'm a man under authority. I understand this. You don't even need to come. You can just say it and it will be. Well, that's the kind of confident faith I would like to have. But then consider also the father of the child who was possessed by demons, the boy possessed by demons, 
who comes to Jesus and asks him to heal his son. And Jesus asks, do you believe? And he says, I do believe, but help my unbelief. They both end up with healed subjects. The, the servant is healed. The son is healed. These are both people with faith. One is a confident faith, and the, the, the other is a timid faith. But they're both faith. The centurion and the father both received what they asked because their faith was in the right person. One was confident, one was timid, one was doubting, and yet their faith was in the right person. Which is why walking with God by faith is not saying that our, our certainty, our, our personal certainty, or our emotional stability are what bring that faith to life. It is not me going around saying, I am confident in my faith, and therefore it becomes visible. There's people who have great confidence in things that have no ability to help them. And that will not make their faith visible. It will actually make their faith fail. Well, they may continue in faith, but no one looking at them will say, there's a person with faith in something real. But there is a way that faith becomes visible, according to Scripture. Our faith becomes visible not through our confidence and our certainty and our emotional stability, but through our obedience. We walk with God by faith, which is how it's possible, for obedience, which is what makes it visible. Classic text on this is in James 2. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. Someone will say, I have faith, you have deeds. Well, show me your faith without deeds, make it visible, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe there is one God? Good! Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. Foolish person, do you want evidence that faith without deeds is useless? Was not our father Abraham considered righteous for what he did when he offered his son Isaac on the altar? You see that his faith and his actions work together, and his faith was made complete or visible by what he did. And the scripture was fulfilled that says Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness, and he was called God's friend. So you see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Obedience makes faith visible. And, interestingly, it creates a feedback loop. When my obedience makes my faith visible, it actually increases my confidence in the one in whom I have faith. It builds confidence that my faith in Christ is powerful and effective in transforming me into a righteous person. It builds confidence in our own faith. So faith and obedience create this feedback loop where our faith leads to obedience, which leads to increased faith, which leads to increased obedience. One warning here is that obedience never comes prior to faith, but it is never absent from true faith. Never comes prior. One of the great risks of seeking to be obedient to the commands of Christ is to become obsessed with measuring our obedience. Who is more righteous? Who is more obedient? Who among us is the greatest? To walk with God in faith for obedience, one must walk with humility. Faith makes walking with God possible. Obedience makes walking with God visible. Humility makes walking with God natural, effortless. 
It's an interesting thing in, in the Corinthian epistles, in 1 Corinthians 4, Paul says something very fascinating. He says, this, this then is how you ought to regard us, he's writing to the Corinthian church, as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the mysteries of God revealed. Now it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. So Paul, Paul is, 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 is perfectly willing to say, look, I'm entrusted with a, the gospel message. It's something pretty important. But you know what I don't bother doing? I don't bother judging myself. I don't bother judging myself. He, he goes on in chapter 5 to say, what business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Philosopher Peter Kreeft writes that humility, he's defining humility as the very grammar of being. It is saying, God is the noun, and we are the adjectives, never the other way around. He riffs on C.S. Lewis, saying, humility does not mean having a low opinion of ourselves. Humility means having no opinion of ourselves. Humility does not mean having a low opinion of ourselves. It means having no opinion of ourselves. It means using our eyes as they were designed to be used to look out, to look and love outward towards God and neighbor, to be freed from the agonized shadow of self-consciousness and self-judgment that clouds our happy vision of the sunlight. Let the sun pierce those clouds. Let Him in all things even when he walks on stormy waters and believe his word, it is I, do not be afraid. True humility isn't proud, and that may seem obvious, saying, I'm doing so well. But true humility is also not debased, saying, oh, I'm such a failure. Do you ever recognize that as pride? It is thinking a great deal about yourself. The true humility isn't even wishy-washy middle. Oh, I'm just a regular guy, Charlie Brown. Even that isn't humble. No, true humility simply has no space for self-judgment. It has no opinion of itself. You know, it's a fascinating thing here that there is precisely one positive affirmation of judging for the Christian in the Scriptures other believers in your fellowship. We do not judge ourselves. We do not judge those outside the church. But that committed body of believers which sharpen one another in the faith and obedience through humble mutual correction, that is the true community where defensiveness is unknown because no one regards themselves as good or bad. No one has time to think about themselves. No one can become defensive because they're practicing humility. They have no opinion of themselves. Where sin is exposed, confessed, and absolved, because instead of constantly staring at ourselves, we are looking at each other with clear eyes. And we love one another enough not to let each other wallow in filth. And that can only happen when we walk with God, by faith, for obedience, with humility. All of this really makes Enoch more impressive. Because, because Enoch, Enoch, it surely appears that Enoch did this alone. We are greatly advantaged to be given the assembly of the church so that we may walk with God together. So what does this look like for us? Well, here's a few ideas. You're minding your own business when a man walks up to you and says, follow me. It requires being a person of faith, intent upon obedience with humility to get up, leave your fishing boat, and follow that man. There's negative examples. You ask what attaining eternal life requires and you receive the reply, go, sell all you have, give to the money of the, to the poor and come follow me. That man was unable to do it because he lacked faith for the purpose of obedience with humility. 
perhaps more challenging, there's things like the man who'd been healed of demonic possession and longed to travel with Jesus, but was told, go. Tell all your friends and family of how much God has done for you. And for many of us, and for, for weary indebted first century peasants, or maybe weary indebted 21st century peasants, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Acceptance of that rest requires just as much faith, obedience, and humility as going forth to tell all your friends and family how much God has done for you. There's corollaries here of what it doesn't look like. One thing it doesn't look like is, Jesus, come participate in my direction. Enoch walked with God. God did not walk with Enoch. We do not invite God to go where we're going. We go where He's going. We don't conditionally ask Him to walk with us. True humility knows who is setting the direction and the pace. It does not look like, Jesus, let me be me. We obey His conditions. We are, remember, God's people living with God's other creatures on God's terms. True obedience knows who defines good and bad, right and wrong. The person who wanted to let me be me ends with, and then he died. It does not look like, Jesus, help me accomplish my priorities. True faith begins with the surrender of my priorities. True faith demands a change in the center of priorities, even if I don't get to know what they are. Isn't that frustrating? That to have true faith in God means saying, God, your priorities, and God says, yep. And I'm like, what are they? I would like to go accomplish now. But no, I just follow. I don't necessarily know what those priorities are. Some questions worth asking yourself. One, are, are you walking with God? You know, having no opinion of yourself doesn't mean never examining yourself. It doesn't mean being totally unself-aware. Self-forgetfulness self doesn't judge oneself. It doesn't mean not know oneself. That's immaturity. So it is good to ask ourselves, are we walking with God? Our humility becomes apparent when we decide how we're going to determine if we're walking with God. There is a simple way to know. Ask. If one is practicing true humility, obedience, and faith, this is a question that can only be answered one way, by someone else telling you. Because you don't have the perspective to answer it on your own. Now, God has graciously given us other Christians who are charged with carrying the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Is that a scary thought? It shouldn't be. It should be deeply encouraging. If I stray from the path of faith, obedience, and humility, God has given me a community of faith, obedience, and humility who can pull me back onto the right road, who can say, dude, where are you going? But I have to open myself up to that and not be defensive, be humble, be obedient with faith. Another question worth asking is, have I been attempting to walk on my head? By which I mean trying to be obedient prior to my faith. When we try and prove ourselves by obedience in order to make God good, to say, I know God exists, but He'll only be good if I'm good enough to measure up, then we're standing on our heads. We're trying to prove ourselves by obedience while not having faith that God rewards those who earnestly seek Him. We will be crushed by the accurately infinite expectations of living up to God's standards. If you're trying to earn God's favor, it will grind you to powder. Before our obedience, we must enter life through faith that God is who He says He is, loves as He says He loves, and saves as He says He saves then our obedience is unchained. We worry not that we must earn something, but can rejoice in having been entrusted with something. 
So friends, if you are here this morning wondering what a faithful, obedient, humble walk with God looks like, I invite you to come back week after week and month after month and year after year to this community because we cannot wait to disappoint you. Because if you think that we here are shining examples of perfect saints, I have news for you, we're still here. God has not yet drawn us up into his presence. There are only two occasions in the Bible in which we know this happened. One was Enoch, who followed God all the way home on their afternoon walk, and Elijah, who was carried into the presence of God on a chariot of fire, and I haven't seen any chariots in the heavens recently, even though the sunrise this morning was fairly impressive. So once again, I invite you to come gather worship and adore the same Lord, because it is to Him all this points, not to us. It is in Him that our faith is placed. It is to Him that our obedience is directed. And it is before Him that we humbly bow and offer worship. And our worship is really before Him. Coram Deo, before God. And as we go now into our time of open worship this morning... I want to remind you that this really is before him. This is our faith, that Jesus Christ's presence is not a symbol or a reflection or a ritual, but a substantial reality. We believe that in the gathering of his people, Jesus Christ is truly present. It is a real presence. So I invite you now to listen with a heart of faith. Wait, having determined that you will be obedient and receive with humility that which looks only for what is given. Family history can be really interesting and challenging and sometimes disturbing. This morning we looked at the first genealogy in the Bible, the first time that God saw fit in his scriptures to lay down what the human family was made of. Do you know where the last genealogy in the Bible is? It's in the Gospel of Luke. And that genealogy does not end with, and then he died. The glory of the story of redemption in Scripture is that our family history begins and ends with Jesus Christ. Theologian J.I. Packer uh, famously said that, well, the theological center of the gospel is substitutionary atonement, sacrifice. That the most mind-blowing mystery of the gospel is adoption. That our family history is the family history of the man who conquered death. So I invite you as you attempt to walk by faith with obedience and humility to rest, to know in the truth that this has been accomplished on your behalf. And you may be invited into a family that never ends with, and then he died. I'm going to pray and invite our worship team to come back up for closing songs. Oh God, grant that we might desire you. And that desiring you, we would seek you. And that seeking you, we would find you. 
and in finding you, be satisfied in you forever. Amen. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for the good of those who love God, who have been called according to his purpose. Go this morning. Walk as a people confident of God's goodness, dependent on faith, unchained in obedience, and filled with humility. Majesty, worship his majesty, unto Jesus be all glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom, authority, flow from his throne unto his throne. If you found this video helpful or enriching to your life, 
You may find more of Cherry Grove Worship Services at the following link. If you wish to contact Cherry Grove Friends Church for more information, please contact our pastor, Mark Franklin, at this email address. If you wish to leave a prayer request, go to the following link and click on How Can We Pray For You?